Well, good morning, my friends, and happy Sabbath to you. I pray that this day is a blessing to you. And I, I want to share with you a story that just uh, really was uh, a blessing uh, to me, a story of Kala Smith. Kala uh, was a young woman who just last week shared a testimony. I think it was last week, shared a testimony at the Pioneer Memorial Church. And she shared uh, on that day that she had been away from church for, for several months. Uh, she was having a difficult time. She came back and she noticed uh, a woman who was setting up and breaking down uh, equipment on the platform for worship. And she recognized the woman. She knew who that woman was. And she came up to the pastor after services and asked the pastor, where did you meet that, that woman who is working up on the platform? And the pastor told her that uh, a while back he had met her in, in prison. They had studied together and she had recently been, uh, been baptized. And the pastor asked Kala, uh, do you know her from some place? Is she, does she look familiar to you? And Kala said, yes, I know her. About 10 years ago, when I was 17, she was the one who sold me into sex trafficking. What do we do? When the Lord brings into the church someone who has done wrong to us. What do we do when the Lord brings into the church someone who has violated us or, or someone we love? Someone we would prefer not to be around. What do we do when we find in the church someone who we fully disagree with uh, or have animosity toward or someone who has animosity toward us? Someone who we have some big differences with. Today, we're going to look again at the call of Levi Matthew because I believe this account shares with us, shows us, how we can address these things. God has called him. Let us embrace him. Let's turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Last week we took a look at Levi Matthew's challenge to us. And in other words, hey, I accepted the call despite my reputation. I accepted the call despite my, uh, my good source of income, you have no excuse not to accept Jesus' call. Well, this week we're going to take a look at Levi Matthew's challenge for us. Have you ever considered the challenge that Levi Matthew presented to Jesus? Now, I want to remind you that uh, in some Gospels he is called Levi, in some Gospels he's called Matthew. He has two names, and we're going to be putting them together when, when talking about him. But have you ever considered Levi Matthew's challenge for Jesus? Why do I ask that? Well, remember uh, what, the, uh, what the reputation that tax collectors or, or publicans had in Israel in the Gospel of Matthew, we are told that they are associated with sinners. They are associated with heathen, that is, unbelievers, Gentiles, people who are outside of our faith. They are associated with harlots. They were despised by the children of Israel. When Jesus went to lodge and dine with another tax collector in the Gospel of Luke, uh, there are some who grumbled and said, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. With a man who is a sinner. Well, now Jesus uh, sees Levi Matthew. Jesus notices Levi Matthew. Jesus focuses on Levi Matthew, and he sees that this man is ready to follow him. But is he going to call one who has such a reputation? As this, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. 
I remember, uh, I don't think I was in high school yet. I cannot, I'm not certain. Uh, but there was someone several blocks away from me, a young, uh, a boy about my age who lived several blocks away from me. I believe his name was Gary. And Gary said, John, why don't we get together? Let's, let's be friends. Let's hang out with one another. But I didn't want to do that. You see, Gary had epilepsy. And Gary was not cool to hang out with. Gary, I felt, would be a, a burden to me. And I just really didn't want to be seen with Gary. Now, to this day, I am ashamed of, uh, of the way I treated him, of the way I responded uh, to him. My response to Gary is in total contrast to how Jesus viewed Levi Matthew. Jesus knew of the reputation of this man. Jesus knew how tax collectors were viewed in the eyes of his fellow citizens in Israel, but Jesus called him despite. Jesus did not give any weight to the prejudices of God's people at that time. Jesus would not consider at all what, how negatively people viewed tax collectors. Jesus called him despite. Desire of Ages, page 273, tells us, the calling of Levi Matthew to be one of Christ's disciples excited what? Great indignation. For a religious teacher to choose a publican as one of his immediate attendants was an offense against the religious, social, and national customs. My friends, this should give us great hope. This should be for us some wonderful assurance. We are a challenge to Jesus as well. Like Levi Matthew, we are a challenge to him. We have disqualified ourselves from being, from being candidates for the kingdom of God, never mind being a witness for Jesus Christ, being sent by him to lead others to salvation. We have all dishonored him, we have all done, done wrong in his, in his eyes. We have all brought his name in ill repute before others. But that does not stop Jesus from calling you. He considers you more important than his reputation. He considers me to be more important than his image. How do I know that? Because he hung on the cross naked for you. He hung on the cross naked for me. He bore reproach. He bore shame. He bore insult. He suffered what was considered to be uh, the most miserable uh, death that anyone can suffer among Israel. He took upon himself the curse that belonged to you and that belonged to me. He wasn't concerned about his reputation. He wasn't concerned about how people thought about him. He was concerned about your soul. He was concerned about my soul. He wanted to spend eternity with us and he wanted to make us a witness to others of the grace, the love, and the power of Christ. Jesus had this attitude toward Levi Matthew. Jesus has this attitude toward you. Jesus has this attitude toward me, we should have this attitude toward one another. Jesus has called him. Let us embrace him. Yes, Levi Matthew was a challenge for Jesus. But have you considered as well the challenge that Levi Matthew presented for the disciples as well? What do I mean? Let's take a look at some logistics to get an idea of that. Uh, to begin with, uh, let us look at uh, Levi, uh, Mark's version of this account. He said, Then Jesus went out again where? By the sea. And all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. So please note, Levi planted, Levi Matthew planted his tax office by the sea. He was within earshot of Jesus. 
he heard Jesus teaching that made a that made a remark on him and so he planted his tax office by the sea but let's continue let's take a look at uh, what else Mark had to say uh, about this earlier in the accounts of the Gospel of Mark it talks about Peter and Andrew and James and John's calling and as Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net where into the sea why for they were fishermen so let's note Levi Matthew plants his tax office by the sea and Peter and Andrew are working at the sea let's put two and two together Levi Matthew collected taxes by the sea plus Peter and Andrew worked at the sea what can we conclude from this Levi Matthew collected taxes from Peter and Andrew imagine for a moment the kind of contention that the kind of tension that must have existed between Levi Matthew and Peter and Andrew and James and John for they were fellow fishermen hey this man took money from us and gave it to the Romans and you Jesus are gonna call him to team with us I don't want to be on this man's team I don't want to be numbered with him I don't want to be seen with him this man took a portion of my hard worked income and gave it to those who oppress us I don't want to be around this man but it wasn't just Peter and James and John and Andrew that uh, Levi Matthew presented a challenge to for example let's take a look at the list of the 12 Apostles we have Matthew the tax collector but we also have another Simon a Simon who is called what the zealot a Simon who is called the zealot now what were zealots zealots ze zealots were those who sought to uproot and get rid of the Romans entirely in their reign in their oppression in their rule over Israel they resorted at times even to military means to get rid of the Romans here you have Matthew who is working for the Romans and here you have Simon who wanted to get rid of the Romans here you had two men who had completely different political biases extremely polarized political bi uh, biases and Jesus calls both of them to be his witnesses his laborers his disciples his apostles pastor Chris Thomas was a pastor in Alabama during the very contentious 2020 presidential election and one time he said something in one of his sermons that was taken by one of the factions in his church as an anti Trump a Trump slogan President Trump slogan and so and what I just said might have been taken as an anti Trump slogan uh, but they at that point and other factions within the church began to analyze more and more uh, what the pastor was preaching every word was dissected every word was scrutinized and if he said one thing wrong one group or the other would get offended there the church became uh, fractious the church became divisive and a group of Trump supporters eventually left that church and began attending another church which they felt lined up with their political ideologies and their political thoughts but those who remain continued uh, to scrutinize Pres uh, uh, pastor Chris's words and eventually pastor Chris Thomas himself left that church we get an idea of what kind of balance what kind of challenges that Jesus dealt with and the fellow disciples dealt with in the calling of Levi Matthew 
If the story ended there, we would think that this was going to be a disaster. But these men studied Jesus. These men watched the way that he interacted with others. They saw his compassion on the outcast. They saw his compassion for the poor and for the hurting. They saw his love and his pity on those who received, who never received it from another. They learned at the feet of Jesus and saw that their squabbles with one another, their differences with one another, the wrongs that they have done to one another uh, was far overshadowed by the calling that Jesus gave them. Furthermore, they saw their teacher crucified on the cross. They saw him ridiculed. They saw him mocked. But even more than that, they saw him again the third day. And they knew, they discovered, they learned, they experienced the power of God. And what was the result of all this? Acts chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. And when they entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, Matthew the tax collector, and Simon the zealot. These all continued how? With one accord in prayer and in supplication. Oh, my friend, let's take note of this. Jesus took men who had offended one another, who, who felt that they were wronged by one another. Jesus took this group of men who were very polarized, very much at odds with one another in regards to their philosophy, in regards to their political ideology. And he brought them together and put them, set them on a, con a common agenda. If Jesus can do this with Levi Matthew, if Jesus can do this with Peter, Andrew, James, and John, from whom he apparently collected taxes from, if he can do this with Simon the Zealot, who was completely at odds uh, with this man, if he can do this with these disciples, he can do this with you, and he can do this with me. Jesus has called, uh, called him, let us embrace him. Levi Matthew presented a challenge for Jesus. Levi Matthew presented a challenge for the disciples. And Levi Matthew presents a challenge for us. Is there a Levi Matthew in our church? Is there a, one that you view as a Levi Matthew? Is there someone that you feel has been malicious towards you? Is there someone that you feel has wronged you, has intentionally stepped on your toes? Is there someone you feel that has brought you down, has assassinated your character? Is there someone you feel uh, that is always looking for handouts or is withdrawing what he can give or what she can give from the church? Is there someone in the church that is passionate about their political views and you hold different views from them and you would prefer not to talk with them, you would prefer to keep your distance from them? Is there someone that you feel the church can do better without? My friends, Jesus' call of Levi Matthew rebukes this mindset. I have come to believe that there are two classes of people that Jesus brings into our lives. There is one group that shows us the love of Christ, that demonstrates in their actions and in the tone of their voice what Jesus is like. But there's another class of people, a class of people that are brought to us to train us to love like Christ, a group that shows us the love of Christ and a group that trains us to love like Christ. I remember before taking my calling as a full-time pastor, uh, there was a church that I was at and 
uh, there was a fellow member there who, who I will call Joe, who seemed to find fault with everything that I did. Uh, the fault, fault with the way I dressed, fault with the way I prayed, even fault with the way that I knelt in prayer. And I, I will admit there are some Sabbaths that I just felt uh, I didn't want to go to church because I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and thinking, what's Joe going to, what's, how's Joe going to respond to this? How's, how's Joe going to respond to that? But I decided at some point to put that all behind me and remember that Joe is a fellow disciple of Christ. And one of my uh, most uplifting days was when uh, quite a few years later, when Sherry and I uh, were pastoring in another district in Illinois, we went to the Northeast to visit family. And on our way back, I, I heard that Joe had knee surgery and that he was in a nursing home uh, going through rehabilitation. And we decided on our way back to go and visit Joe, visit him, connect with him, see how he is doing and pray with him. And that was one of the most blessed experiences that I had. I chose to put things behind me, reach out to Joe, and to minister to him. My friends, the church is a training ground. A training ground where we learn how to love those that we don't have a good chemistry with. To love those that we may flesh-wise, that we may gut-wise prefer not to be around. A training ground where we love those that we have differences with. When we consider those that we don't have a good chemistry with, let us remember the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 18, verse 10, where he tells us, Take heed that you, dis that you do not what? That you do not despise one of these little ones. And if you look at the context, if you look at the context of Matthew 18, it'll be clear to you that by the little ones, he's referring to fellow believers. He's referring to fellow church members. Take heed that you do not despise one of these fellow church members. Why? For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And in other words, Jesus is saying this, that fellow church member that you tend to despise, that fellow church member that you are tempted to look down on, God has assigned his highest angels, those who look upon his face, those who behold his face, God has assigned them to be their protector, to be their helper, to minister to them, to lead them, onto the path of salvation. This person that you tend to despise is so important to God that he has assigned some of his highest angels to him. If they are that important to him, they should be that important to you. God values those that we tend to look down on. God values those church members that we would prefer to have distance between. Like the disciples, God is calling us to make our common calling a higher priority than any personal differences, any political differences, any strained or marred past history we may have with that individual. Like the disciples, God is calling us to rise above these things and team up with one another to fulfill the commission that he has given to us. Like the disciples, he is calling us to come to the cross and share with him, share with Jesus in his death, share with Jesus in his burial, share with Jesus in his resurrection, so that we may now live the life of Christ and view our brother and sister not as one who has wronged us, not as one who is against us, not as one who has offended us, not as one who we do not get along with, but view our brother and sister in the eyes of Christ as one whom God values and loves, 
one who Jesus has died for. Jesus has called him. Let us embrace him. Let us embrace him. Let's get back to Carla Smith. The woman who had sold her into sex trafficking 10 years earlier, her name was Julie. And Kala got up the courage and went to talk with Julie and asked Julie, do you remember me? And Julie looked at Kala and said, you look familiar, but I'm not sure. And Kala told her, when I was 17 years old, you sold me into sex trafficking. And Julie asked her, do you remember what we named you? You see, when they, when they do the sex trafficking, they try to change the young girl's identity so she's not easily tracked down. And Julie told her what her name was. And at that point, I mean, Kala told her what her name was. And at that point, Julie remembered, dropped to her knees and began groveling before Kala, crying and pleading with her for forgiveness. Kala saw that God had changed Julie's heart. Kala saw that Julie was now a child of God. And Kala wrapped her arms around her, cried with her, and forgave her. Oh, my friends, God is going to bring into the church those who have wronged us. God is going to have in the church those who we may have difficulty getting along with. God is going to have in the church those who we feel we just do not connect with. But we are called, like Kala did, to forgive. We are called, like Kala did, to put those things behind us. We are called to embrace that brother or that sister, team up with them, share with them in their work to lead souls to Christ, work together to minister in the gospel. We are called to make our common calling, our common commission, a higher priority than the petty differences we may have or have had. We are called to bond with those who have done us wrong. We are called to come to the cross and die with Christ, be buried with Christ, and to be resurrected with him, that we might have a new life, that we might look upon people not as those who have wounded our tender pride, but as those who have been purchased by Christ and whom he, we are, are to team with to share the gospel with others. My prayer and my hope is that as Jesus called him or as Jesus called her, we will embrace him and we will embrace her. This is my prayer for each of us in Jesus' name.